Good evening, everyone, and we're really grateful you could join us for this evening's webinar. My name is B.J. McManama. I'm a descendant of the Seneca peoples who called these lands home for countless generations. I'm an organizer for the Indigenous Environmental Network, and my family and I call North Central West Virginia home. And I'm here this evening to speak for my family, my friends, and my community. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to honor the original peoples of the Ohio River Valley and the greater Appalachia area. The culture and history of this very diverse and rich ecosystem has, and for now, continues to provide us with all that we need to live healthy and productive lives. We all share the history and heritage of the Seneca, Mingo, Shawnee, Cherokee, and many other nations that unfortunately have been long forgotten. Their contributions they gave us to the lifeways, they taught the new people that helped them to survive and thrive in these regions and why we're all here today. I offer my gratitude and thanks to the organizers of the HZ Plastic event. And I, along with everyone involved tonight, send good mind out to everyone attending. And we hope that you and loved ones are and remain well during these trying times. Tonight, we're here to begin the A to Z Impacts of Plastics digital series. And we continue the process of building a connected base of frontline communities, the people along the Ohio River Valley, which includes a large portion of Appalachia, and to address regional and worldwide threats from the petrochemical industry. We aim to expose the threats and costs to those impacted by ecological devastation and to continue putting forward analysis of industry actions in terms of the interlocking systems of poverty, racism, ecological devastation, and militarism. We intend to engage and build a strong coalition of people who have and who have not yet felt a visceral connection to the struggle between promoters and opponents of the Appalachian Storage Hub, the Dills Bottom Ethane Cracker, the extension of fracking in the Marcellus Shale Play into the next decade, and related projects, including those that maintain and expand consumer dependence on single-use plastics. During this series, we will clearly outline the detrimental consequences already being experienced in areas where the petrochemical industries are operating. We will clearly outline how plastics affect our health, the economy, environment, and climate. This includes exposing the truth about how and who is impacted and who is profiting. We will discuss the erosion of democracy due to the government and industry's consolidation of control and power. We will examine the politics and reasons why the Ohio River Valley is the target area for transformation into the next big petrochemical hub. We'll also look at why this location is now in the crosshairs of this industry and the economics of an area desperate for the trade-offs, desperate for jobs and the trade-offs people are willing to make for regardless of the consequences. We will also help to foster broad public understanding of the dangers of the radioactivity in produced water from fracking operations, the destruction of clean water resources, and other key issues that put us all at risk. Our aim is to help everyone change the way they think about toxicity as well. Is it just an inevitable part of the modern world? How much poison is too much? We will discuss behavior changes necessary to live without petroleum-based plastics and present successful plastic reduction projects in other communities. We will facilitate discussions about what we want to preserve and protect in a future society and what we want to change. At this time, I'm now gonna turn this over to Peggy Berry, our moderator for the evening. Thank you, Peggy. Off to you. Thank you, BJ. Hi, I'm Peggy Berry, and I am a nurse advocate, and I have a PhD in nursing research. I have been an advocate since uh, 2010, mostly concerned about chemical transparency with fracking. And I get to introduce everyone, which I, I really am so grateful to uh, both Ned and to uh, Julie for uh, talking this time around for our first session. Uh, Dr. Ned Kattire is a prominent physician uh, outside of, uh, in Pittsburgh and a consultant for Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. He has been gathering research on air quality and health impacts 
for the proposed ethane cracker plant near Pittsburgh. Shell Chemical Appalachia LLC expects the Beaver County cracker plant to be operational in the early 2020s. Uh, it will crack ethane, one of the components of natural gas, to produce ethylene, the building blocks of plastic. The air quality of the southwestern PA is already poor, and there are many more cancer cases that there were compared to other states. Dr. Katire will explain his findings and answer questions about known health effects of fracking and cracking natural gas. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Katire. And he and I are both climate reality leaders. We met in Pittsburgh. Thank you, Peggy. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Let's see if I can get this going without losing a finger. Can you see my screen? Okay, very good. You can see your screen. And everyone, Great, if you have questions, please put them in the chat uh, as uh, Dr. Katire uh, uh, continues his uh, program. That way we won't miss your questions. Please put your questions in chat. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, everybody. I, I'm just really happy to be here. I, I'm very honored to be uh, asked to come and speak with you about um, uh, fracking and cracking and uh, the impacts of plastic on our health. Now, I live and work in Washington County, Pennsylvania, which is the most heavily fracked county in, in the Pennsylvania Marcellus Shale gas patch. Now, I'm a medical consultant for Environmental Health Project and a board member of PSR Pennsylvania. My work mostly focuses on the growing evidence of health harms due to fracking. Uh, as well as those anticipated to arise from the new petrochemical hub being built in this region. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk a lot about fracking and cracking, uh, but I will also take a brief look at the downstream health and environmental damage being caused by plastic pollution. Unconventional shale gas development has been underway in the, shale, in the Marcella Shale region of Southwest Pennsylvania for more than a decade. In addition to methane, the region has abundant reserves of ethane, a liquid hydrocarbon used to manufacture plastic and other petrochemicals. The purpose of rapidly expanding fracking operations here is to establish a brand new petrochemical and plastics hub in the upper Ohio River Valley, far away from the US Gulf Coast and Cancer Alley, where the petrochemical industrial complex is currently situated. We now have abundant scientific and medical evidence that fracking seriously damages the health of people, the environment, and the planet's climate system. Fracked ethane will make its way to this ethane cracker plant currently being built by Royal Dutch Shell in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. This is one of the largest petrochemical and plastic factories ever built anywhere. Here, ethane molecules will be thermally and chemically broken or cracked into ethylene. Once this cracker plant is completed and operational in the next year or so, it will produce 1.8 million tons of polyethylene, enough to make 80 trillion of these tiny plastic pellets called nurdles every single year. At least two more ethane cracker plants are planned for the Ohio Valley over the next few years with nearly 1,000 new fracked gas wells drilled every year in this region just to feed them. The life of plastic begins at the wellhead where fracking for ethane is just the first of many threats to human health during its life cycle. The creation of plastic nurdles and the production of consumer products, most of which are designed for single use, compound the dangers. Until we decide one day that we're done with it and dump plastic and its toxic components into landfills and streams and oceans, into our air and water and food, and eventually into you and me. 
Science is quickly learning that the toxic emissions and chemicals associated with plastics are harmful to our health throughout our life cycle. Many are highly irritating to our skin, our gastrointestinal tract, and our lungs. Many affect the outcomes of pregnancies and interfere with fetal and infant growth and brain development. We now understand how some toxics act as endocrine disrupting chemicals, affecting human development and reproduction. Some weaken the immune system, some increase the risk of chronic inflammatory diseases, some damage organs directly, especially the brain, liver, and kidneys, and dozens of chemicals appearing in the life of plastics are linked to cancers in adults and children, including 55 individual chemicals used in fracking. Plastics are strong, they're durable, they're cheap, but these same properties that make plastics so useful in our society make plastics so dangerous when we throw them away. Once in the environment, plastic breaks down and erodes into smaller units, eventually becoming tiny particles called microplastics that can be carried by winds and currents to near and distant places. As this happens, the chemicals added to plastics separate and enter the environment, contaminating the air, water, and soil, and the food chain that we and our children depend on. Here is a list of people whose health is most vulnerable to, plastic, to environmental degradation caused by shale gas and petrochemical pollution. See if you can find yourself or a loved one on this list. Pregnant women and fetuses are at risk for developing complications of pregnancy and poor fetal health outcomes. The health risks to infants and children living near shale gas development is especially concerning due to the fact that their behaviors and interactions with the environment increase their chances of exposure to toxic chemicals. And because children's bodies grow and develop rapidly, making their organs more susceptible to damage from toxic exposures. Older people and those with limited financial resources are also at risk. People of color often live in environmental justice zones close to polluting industries like these. Residents living in proximity to shale gas development who have chronic medical conditions like chronic lung disease, heart disease, and children with asthma are at higher risk for having exacerbations of those diseases. Industry workers are of course at high risk of acute injur injuries, exposures, and illnesses. Workers and athletes who spend a lot of time, time outdoors breathing polluted air are more vulnerable. And we shouldn't forget our first responders. In the US, the shale gas industry is not legally required to disclose the identity of the chemicals used in fracking operations. This secrecy puts first responders at a disadvantage when called on to respond to an emergency, and it puts their health and safety in danger. This is what fracking in Pennsylvania looks like. There are now more than 12,000 active shale gas wells, wells in the state, which you see is the purple dots on this frack tracker map. Most of the activity is in the northeastern and southwestern parts of the state and almost all of it has happened in the last 10 years. The green dots show where the compressor stations are that move gas along the pipelines, and the yellow dots indicate where all the violations have occurred so far. Fracking is inherently dirty and dangerous, and industry rules and government regulations can't fix that fact, especially when the precautionary principle is ignored. Shale gas extraction involves drilling a hole more than a mile deep into an ancient shale formation rich in hydrocarbons, then turning the well horizontally and drilling laterally a few miles more. Once the well is established, diesel engines pump huge volumes of fresh water, sand, and chemicals into the well under enormous pressure. The high pressure cracks open the shale, and sand keeps those cracks propped open allowing the hydrocarbons to flow up to the surface. But it's not only the hydrocarbons that come back up. Solid drill cuttings and salty corrosive brine are contaminated with fracking chemicals, heavy metals, and other earth elements from the highly radioactive Marcellus shale. Non-fuel gases like volatile organic compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, 
and hydrogen sulfide, the fumes of fossil fuels, return to the surface and contaminate the air we breathe. What comes back up in the form of solid waste gets trucked to commercial and municipal landfills where it is buried. There, toxic leachate finds its way into the area's rivers and streams where communities source their drinking water. The liquid waste, a toxic cocktail of chemicals, salts, and water-soluble radium, is disposed of in deep underground injection wells, which has been shown to contaminate water and produce earthquakes. Some of the toxic brine is even packaged and marketed to municipalities and consumers as de-icing agents and pool salts. Harmful pollution is generated at every point of frat gas infrastructure, from the teeming diesel truck traffic servicing the super well pads that hold dozens of gas wells on them, and from the toxic and radioactive waste that is generated at the wellhead and must be disposed of. Pipelines scar the landscape and occasionally leak and spill their contents. Compressor stations move gas along pipelines while emitting copious volumes of air pollution like ozone forming nitrogen dioxide and VOCs. And pollution continues at shale gas refineries that process the hydrocarbons. From there, pipelines direct frack gas to local cracker plants, as well as to LNG export terminals and distant countries with an insatiable appetite for single-use plastic. Keep in mind, all this drilling and fracking is happening near where people live and children play. The well pads and the pipelines, compressor stations and processing facilities are all operating around where children go to school. This school campus in rural Washington County, Pennsylvania is surrounded by five well pads and other infrastructure. The closest well pad you see on the left is 900 feet from the school's driveway, 900 feet from the only entrance and exit into and out of this school's campus. And fracking is happening around where children play. I don't think any parent and certainly no pediatrician would look at this photograph and find it acceptable in any way. Because they are growing and developing rapidly, children are more vulnerable to environmental toxics. Most of the emissions coming from frack gas and petrochemical infrastructure is invisible. My colleague, Leanne Leiter at Earthworks, loan me this video to show you how looks can be deceiving. This is a compressor station in rural Washington County. So here we are in the middle of the afternoon. You can see everything in and around the compressor station looks clean and quiet. There's no smoke, no emissions that you can see. But the expensive infrared FLIR camera that Leanne uses shows us, shows us what our eyes can't prodigious volumes of volatile organic compounds and hydrocarbons coming out of that building. So that's a compressor station. And what you see, it looks like smoke, but you saw there was no smoke in the visual images. But with the FLIR camera, uh, these emissions coming out are pretty extensive. Uh, this is in the middle of the day, 3.21 PM. Uh, but the FLIR camera makes it look like nighttime. But don't be fooled, this is day, these are daytime emissions uh, in broad daylight. And it really is remarkable. Uh, these are invisible emissions and they're everywhere in the gas patch. And these emissions uh, cause real harm to real people. Beth Weinberg and other colleagues at EHP conducted a community-based study that was published in 2017 which showed that people who live near fracked gas operations report many different adverse health symptoms. Sleep disruption is often the result of the nonstop truck activity, noise, and light while a well is being drilled and fracked. Headaches and throat irritation are also widely reported. Stress and anxiety are common side effects of living near fracking sites. Some of these symptoms look like nuisance complaints, but when people are exposed to this level of emissions over months and in some cases years, these acute symptoms of exposure and stress can become chronic medical problems. The risks and harms of fracking are well known and well documented in the sixth edition of the Fracking Science Compendium published in 2019 by Physicians for Social Responsibility 
and concerned health professionals of New York, a state which has successfully banned fracking. This report uh, is available online, uh, and there are more than 1,700 peer-reviewed studies and investigative reports that found no evidence that fracking can operate without threatening public health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which public health depends. The evidence is in. We've learned a lot since fracking began more than a decade ago. Fracking is a, drew, a proven threat to drinking water. The evidence is in. Air pollution follows fracking because it is produced at every point of operations. The emissions released into the air during fracking, cracking, and beyond are dangerous to our health in many ways. More than 170 fracking chemicals have been shown to be harmful to health. Some are known to irritate the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, and the skin. Dozens of fracking chemicals are known to cause cancer, and many more act as endocrine disrupting chemicals that harm health. Silica dust released from frac sand can potentially cause silicosis and lung cancer, especially in exposed workers. VOCs are the fumes and vapors of fossil fuels and are abundant uh, in shale gas. Benzene is known to cause cancer in children and adults. Toluene exposure can result in permanent neurologic damage. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are another dangerous component of shale gas. Some of these act as endocrine disrupting chemicals, which interfere with hormone functions in the body, especially the growth and brain development of infants and children. In adults, can, exposure can lead to cancer. PM 2.5 is fine particulate matter. It is invisible, yet its damaging effects are quite large. There are abundant medical studies now showing that exposure to PM 2.5 can complicate pregnancies and result in developmental disabilities in children. Chronically breathing fine particulate pollution can cause sickness and death from heart attacks, strokes, and chronic diseases like COPD. It worsens asthma in children. Breathing PM 2.5 pollution is known to cause lung cancer and bladder cancer, and it's linked to other types of cancer in adults. And new research reveals that people who chronically breathe uh, fine particle pollution may have poor outcomes when infected with novel coronavirus. Carbon monoxide from diesel exhaust and burning shale gas on and off well pads is toxic to every human who breathes it. Carbon dioxide is the principal greenhouse gas responsible for global warming and climate change. Nitrogen dioxide pollution occurs at every point of petrofrac development, especially at compressor stations. Abundant nitrogen oxides combined with abundant VOCs in the presence of heat and sunlight to form ground level ozone, which reduces every person's lung function. The Marcellus shale is highly radioactive. Radon gas has been shown to collect in basements and crawl spaces in homes near fracked well pads. Radon, as you know, is, is a, a major cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. It's the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. And finally, large volumes of methane leak inadvertently and are vented on purpose into the atmosphere during fracking operations. Methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, trapping heat in the atmosphere 86 times more effectively than carbon dioxide over a 20-year time frame. It has been determined over and over again that methane leaks like crazy from fracked gas infrastructure. Instead of being a bridge fuel to clean, a cleaner and more sustainable energy future, fracked methane is actually the highway leading to climate catastrophe. The evidence is in. We know that living near fracking sites raises the risks for pregnant women. Low birth rate, low birth weights, prematurity, and birth defects are all outcomes associated with pregnant women living in proximity to shale gas wells. The consequences of some of these impacts persist throughout the course of a child's life. The evidence is in. Living near fracking sites has been linked to asthma, rashes, headaches, and unfortunately, cancer. From 2008 to 2018, in four heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, two Pittsburgh area journalists uncovered 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma, a very rare and frequently fatal bone cancer in childhood, and 40 cases of other rare cancers for a total 
of 67 rare cancers in children, teenagers, and young adults. In just one county alone, mostly rural and suburban Washington County, where I'm from, six cases of Ewing sarcoma and 30 other rare childhood cancers were counted. These numbers are far more than would be expected to occur in a similarly populated area over a 10 year period. And new cases keep popping up in this region. Parents, physicians, and other medical providers are very concerned that pollution and toxic waste from fracking operations may be to blame for this outbreak of rare childhood cancers. It's a plausible concern, considering that at least 55 chemicals used in fracking operations are known to be carcinogenic. In the meantime, real pain is felt in these close-knit communities and by parents who have lost loved ones. The evidence is in, fracking brings noise pollution, light pollution, and stress. Crime, drug and alcohol abuse, sex trafficking, sexually transmitted infections, and traffic fatalities happen at higher rates where fracking takes place. And somehow, I don't know if you can all see that nasty line on this presentation on this screen, and I don't know how to get rid of that. So we're just gonna have to go past that. Uh, fracking jobs are some of the most dangerous jobs in America. Workers who are exposed to physical inju inju injury, air pollution and chemicals and radiation may not have the personal protective equipment uh, necessary and training necessary to protect themselves and their families from harm. Danger exists at every point of fracked gas infrastructure. Pipelines leak, corrode, spill, explode, injure, kill, and prompt evacuations. Water contamination is a danger for many who uh, live along pipeline routes, such as the Mariner East 2 pipeline that runs through Pennsylvania. Let's zoom out from Pennsylvania's gas patch and look at what's going on in the rest of the upper Ohio River Valley. The orange dots in this frack tracker map indicate all the fracked gas well pads uh, that are there mostly to extract ethane to make plastic. Here are the pipelines connecting the shale gas wells to refineries and then onto ethane cracker plants like the one Shell is building in Beaver County to make what nature doesn't need any more of, single-use plastic. Here are all the compressor stations which push the gas to the refineries, export facilities, and ethane crackers. The Shell Ethane Cracker Plant is being built along the banks of the Ohio River in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Zooming out, you can see Pittsburgh International Airport to the south. Downtown Pittsburgh sits to the southwest about 24 miles downwind from the plant. Pittsburgh's long history of air pollution reminds us that air pollution will travel along the river, uh, along the river valley towards downtown. Pennsylvania DEP is allowing these air contaminants to be discharged in these quantities. We, all, we already reviewed some of these emissions, uh, ozone forming nitrogen oxides, cancer causing VOCs and disease inducing PM 2.5. Ammonia is a central nervous system toxicant Look at the CO2 equivalents, 2.2 megatons of planet warming greenhouse gases each year, enough to obliterate any savings from the city of Pittsburgh's ambitious climate action plan. At the very moment when science informs us to urgently reduce fossil fuel consumption and plastics, fracking for plastics is both irresponsible and immoral. When this enormous, enormous petrochemical factory is fully operational, its emissions will settle down on shopping centers and schools, medical facilities, and health systems. One mile east and downwind of the cracker plant is the Beaver Valley Mall. There are shops and restaurants at the mall, and a preschool, a senior center, and a brand new cancer center directly adjacent to it. Two miles downwind from the plant is the Community College of Beaver County, where faculty and students may find it difficult to teach and learn. Several area school district campuses are also downwind. 
Will student academics and athletics suffer when there is so much toxic air pollution spewing from this petrochemical plant and from the many more that are, are expected to follow in this future plastics hub? Will doctors and staff at the Heritage Valley Health System three miles away find it more difficult to provide care to their sick patients? I fear their patients may be sicker and close, the closer that they live and work to the cracker plant. There is a cracker plant being planned for Belmont County in Ohio, across from the Ohio River in Moundsville, West Virginia. You can see the profile of permitted emissions here is similar to the Shell plant. Again, note the huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions allowed by Ohio's EPA. Moundsville sits about two miles east and downwind of the proposed cracker plant. The town is surrounded by hills on all sides and its homes, schools, shopping centers, and hospital sit in a bowl where pollution from the plant will collect. It is reasonable then to ask, why are we doing this? Why are we allowing the people of Moundsville who are living and working, learning and playing in their communities to get soaked, literally soaked with toxic emissions? The answer is always the same, to create a few jobs and a lot more plastic. There's another river system in the United States that Julie will take us to in a few minutes, the Lower Mississippi River Valley lined with oil and gas refineries, cracker plants, and plastics factories. This area goes by another name that everyone should be familiar with. The concern is that the upper Ohio River Valley adjacent to the Marcellus Shale will become America's next cancer alley in a very short time. So I've taken you from the birth of plastics at the wellhead through its developmental journey via diesel engines, pipelines, compressor stations, and refineries to the end of the assembly line at an ethane cracker making fully formed plastic neurals. There is certainly a growing mountain of evidence linking the fracking and the cracking and all the stages in between to adverse health outcomes. Being a pediatrician who deals mostly with life from birth through the formative years, I could easily leave the story of plastic there. But sadly, there's a lot more to the story than that. More than half of all plastic on earth has been made since 2005. Think about that for a second. In just the last 15 years, more than half of all the plastic on this planet was made. And nearly half of all plastic being produced today, the biggest share by far, consists of single-use products and packaging. This graphic from Plastic Atlas shows the common forms of plastic being produced today, along with their recycling codes. Sadly, less than 10% of all plastic ever made has been recycled, and very little plastic made today is even recyclable. Chemicals added to polymers give plastic its versatility and durability. Some chemicals make plastic thinner. Others make it thicker and stronger. Some are dyes that add color. Others give plastic fire-resistant properties. In all, thousands of chemicals, different chemicals, have been used in plastic products, and very few of them have in fact been studied by, for health harms in workers who manufacture them uh, or in consumers who buy and use them. But we do know that some of the chemicals being used have the potential to cause a great deal of harm throughout the human life cycle. This brings us back to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which appear throughout the life cycle of plastics, from the wellhead to, eth to the ethane cracker, to the production line, of consumer goods to the waste stream in our environment. Every day we read more and more about how endocrine disrupting chemicals have cradle to grave impacts on health. They complicate pregnancies and fetal development, infant and child growth can be affected and neurocognitive ab abilities impaired. Hormonal, reproductive and metabolic processes are interfered with as we mature and live out our lives since hormone disruptors are linked to the development of chronic medical conditions and cancer in sensitive organs. This is a short A to Z list of a few of the common chemicals added to plastic materials. This table is from Plastic and Health, the hidden cost of, plastic, of a plastic planet, and it shows what products these chemicals are found in and the no, known health impacts that occur from exposure to them. 
most chemical additives are not bound to the polymer, polymer matrix and they easily leach out of plastic into the surrounding environment. They seep into the air, the water, the food, and the body tissues, becoming a persistent threat to the health and well being of humans and other life forms. Finally, when plastic outlives its usefulness, most of it after 15 seconds or 15 minutes, some of it after 15 days or 15 years, and occasionally longer, it gets thrown away. Very little is ever repurposed or recycled. 40% of plastic waste is from single use packaging. Of all the plastic that gets thrown away, 40% ends up in landfills where it degrades over time. Chemicals leach out of the plastic and potentially out of the landfill to contaminate air, water, and soil. 32% unintentionally or intentionally enters the environment directly. 14% is incinerated, often to generate electricity, and another 14% is either recycled or downcycled to a lower quality and less functional material. Some scientists say that by the middle of this century, there will be more plastic in the oceans by weight than fish. Fossil fuels and plastic materials have benefited humanity. Yes, that's true. But it's also true that the emissions created from extracting and burning fossil fuels and the chemical byproducts created by using them to make and then discard plastics results in an array of human diseases, severe environmental damage, a worldwide ecological catastrophe of plastic pollution, and the acceleration of global heating and climate chaos. So we are left with a choice this choice. We can't have it both ways anymore. And looking back, we probably never could. 40 years from now, children will live in a world shaped by our choices. For our kids and our grandkids, everything depends on how wisely and how quickly we choose. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I'm sorry about this squiggly line. I imagine you're seeing that. I don't know how that occurred, but thank you very much, Peggy. Okay, Ned, please stay on. Um, I do have some questions from the uh, chat box. Some of them have already been answered, so I'm gonna skip those, but um, one of my favorites, and somebody asked this, had to do with um, the workers um, in terms of the, um, Let's see, where is it? Um, material safety data sheets. Does OSHA require the uh, frack pads to uh, have a material safety data sheet to go to the emergency room with them when an exposure occurs? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know the rules and regulations that govern worker safety uh, on the well pad. Um, okay. You would hope that those sheets would be available and they would accompany uh, the patient, the worker to the emergency department. Uh, but I don't know exactly how that works in practice. Okay, because we, we did have some comments in there regarding uh, that workers are being asked to sign something so that they keep quiet about um, the exposure in exchange for treatment being paid for. So that was a concern. An another uh, question was, and I think you answered this, uh, regarding the type of birth defects seen within close proximity of uh, fracking sites. I'm sorry, uh, one more time. The, the, the type, type of birth issues or right. like low birth weight or Right, so um, uh, these chemicals, in fact, when you, when you look at the profile of adverse impacts of pollution in general, it's a cradle to grave uh, uh, damage uh, to the body, beginning with complications of pregnancies, miscarriages, uh, small uh, infants, low birth weight, uh, prematurity. Uh, there are neurocognitive uh, problems that develop Research recently looks at uh, autism as perhaps being caused uh, by uh, pollution in the environment, but also learning disabilities, uh, learning problems, 
uh, ADHD, for example, uh, is, is, uh, has been shown uh, or is thought to be associated with exposure to pollution. Um, uh, there are studies uh, that show uh, that uh, um, congenital heart defects uh, can be associated uh, in women who live close to shell gas wells. Okay, um, another question um, came about, and this will probably be my last question. Um, the, uh, what is the harm that occurs with farmland uh, being uh, irrigated with fracking water and how that might affect uh, the food that we eat and the, and the animals? Do you have any information on that? You know, I know that in California, for example, they do irrigate their crops uh, with some of the frack water. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of the nation's food is actually grown in California, so that should make us all concerned. But, you know, these chemicals, uh, uh, they get into the water, they get into the soil, uh, and they potentially can get into uh, the food. Uh, and, and that's really concerning. Um, I don't know what the deal with uh, using radioactive frack water. I don't know how plants take up that radioactivity. Um, uh, you know, sometimes plants don't take up certain uh, certain elements uh, and chemicals, but sometimes they do. So there needs to be a lot more research uh, into that. Definitely. Can okay. I can I just before you move on uh, the question about uh, the uh, those sheets that uh, on the well pad if a if a worker gets injured has to go to the emergency room. Uh, Patty Demarco writes the worker may not know what they were exposed to. Proprietary information to protect company secrets. Yes, uh, actually a group of us sued uh, to get those uh, proprietary secrets more transparent for the health of the worker as well as for the emergency room treating the injured or exposed worker. Uh, given the time, I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Julie De Dermansky. She is a photojournalist and a multimedia reporter documenting society's impact on the natural world and social injustices. She's based in New Orleans area, putting her at the ground zero to shoot the impacts of climate change on and humankind's role in creating it. Um, she is also an affiliated scholar with Rutgers University Center for study of genocide and human rights and a recipient of the National Endowments for the Arts grant. Her photographs have been published in multiple uh, magazines, The Atlantic, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The Weather Channel, NBC, The Times of London, and The New York Times, uh, Washington Post, Daily Beast, Bloomberg, BuzzFeed, Reveal, Landscape, Architectural Magazine, and the Virginia Quarterly, among others. And her multimedia reportage appears regularly on DSmog, an independent environmental news site. I am really looking forward to Julie's presentation. Thank you. Oh, yours, Julie. Well, thanks. Uh, first, I have to get into that screen sharing mode. Uh, so let's see, exit. Um, let's see if I can remember this share. Um, share computer sound and got it. Okay, so there we go. Do you all see my um, screen there? Did it work? Your screen's up and it looks good. Okay, so let's see, I had to do one more thing to go into the full screen, and that is the green button there. Okay, so this is my first Zoom presentation, so a uh, little bit nervous here, but um, uh, I don't have to do myself much because you seem to have nailed it. Um, I'm an artist turned environmental journalist. Um, after years as a studio artist, uh, I kind of gave up my studio, stopped painting and sculpting, and turned to photography. Um, my first project 
was about dark tourism and I went to a bunch of genocide sites around the world that have been turned into museums and other sites where mankind has uh, perpetrated injustice and those are now kind of all tourist sites like Robbins Island in South Africa where Nelson Mandela was held. Um, after that project, I shifted my focus to humankind's destruction of the environment and all things related to climate change. Uh, so I moved to New Orleans in 2007, where I've been documenting climate change impacts and the forces that make it worse. So um, anytime there's a big storm on the coast, I document the destruction and the recovery and the industrial pollution. Um, as well as the ongoing growth of the petrochemical industry here. Uh, so the first image you're looking at is uh, from post Katrina and this site remained for uh, nine years just about after um, the storm. Uh, so these are just a couple that show kind of what it looks like after a storm. This is in Cancer Alley. Uh, this is after a thousand year flood. Um, all of these thousand year floods, 500 year floods. Just the other day, we had one right near me that they're considering a 100 year flood. So a tornado hit about three miles away. So I'm always on my toes when the weather alerts go off. Um, and then things like this. Uh, let's see, I can move this away. See that? Um, you know, Christmas display like this just shows how normal. Um, Society, defense line communities are huge in the petrochemical industry. Um, yeah, so, let's see. Um, so, anyway, um, I wanted just to show a few images to give you a feel of the type of things that I see driving around uh, doing my coverage. And this is a Christmas parade in Norco where there are a couple refineries. Um, and an aerial view that shows you how close uh, communities can be to the industry. That's um, St. Rose to the right, which brings us now to what's going on with the coronavirus and uh, how the impact from pollution are making people here more susceptible to getting it, as you've probably heard in the, in the media. Uh, that image there is um, of Robert Taylor, so I'm getting ahead of myself. He's the head of the Concerned Citizens of St. John the Baptist Parish. Um, so for the last couple of years, I've been focusing on Cancer Alley, though I've done a lot with fracking around the country, which was apparent in the uh, pre last presentation, because I give my photos to some NGOs who are um, doing educational work. Uh, so it was nice to see some of my pictures used by the doctors. Um, but anyway, um, the uh, map shows that Cancer Alley runs from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. And you saw that, well, or maybe you didn't, there, there are over 100 petrochemical factories and refineries and a lot more are on the way. Uh, we're not done here, just like uh, you guys in New Ohio. Um, the EPA identified sites in Cancer Alley as hotspots for or toxic chemical releases in its last national uh, air toxic assessment. And the report brought more media attention than usual to the area. Um, and these days, it's not only uh, Cancer Alley's pollution topping the charts, but the death rate to COVID-19 among African American communities along fence lines too. Uh, the death rate in St. John the Baptist, Baptist Parish became alarming in early April, and the community continues to reel from the high death rate from the virus. So this picture here of Robert Taylor, he's sitting in front of his house, and he was just pointing down the, up and down the road of, of different people who are either infected or have died of the virus. Um, let's see what I've got next up. Uh, Sharon Levine is the leader of the other uh, community group that formed in the last couple of years, uh, Rise St. James, which you might have heard about. She's been fighting against Formosa, trying to stop them from being able to build a $9.4 billion petrochemical uh, plant that may very well look a bit like um, the Shell uh, cracker plant in Monica, but I think it's even bit bigger. It's a whole complex and they just got 14 different, no, 15 different air permits site 
um, both of the groups have, well, that's the, the um, that, let's see, uh, Robert Taylor's group has been pushing back against this plant, um, which is owned by Denka and had been run by DuPont for 48 years. Um, it's a synthetic rubber plant um, and it emits um, many toxic chemicals, including chloroprene. Um, and um, chloroprene at this point is only emitted here. It used to be uh, at a plant in, um, oh, I'm forgetting the state. Uh, <laughs> but they, uh, Arkansas, but they've closed that down. Um, uh, but um, it's being admitted at higher levels that have been deemed safe by the EPA. And uh, unfortunately, the state regulations are not nearly as tough on chloroprene as they need to be, um, in part because the EPA only reclassified that chemical as a likely human carcinogen in 2010, which makes that community's fight for clean air that much harder because there are no laws to say that the company has to do what the EPA has said is safe. And the EPA isn't ready to make a new rule because it's a five-year process and it's really expensive. And they say that um, they usually just do that for chemicals that are emitted that impact lots of communities, not just one community. Um, so that makes it really tough. In, in this picture, it shows the plant, and if you see the orange building, I don't know if you can see my mouse over it, uh, but that's a school, and behind it are where all the people live, but that's an elementary school. And the group has worked really, really hard to try to uh, have the students moved. Um, that hasn't worked, though COVID-19 has managed to close the school down for now anyway. Um, this is a, a picture of one of the uh, council, parish council meetings that they went to the community members to try to get uh, the company to lower emissions to 0 0.2, which is the level the EPA has recommended. And they have constantly shown up at meeting after meeting. Um, and now sometimes they're joined by Sharon Levine. Uh, this is her at one of the meetings in her parish. Um, and this is a permit hearing. They all go to permit hearings and work together to show each other's group support. Um, and, uh, you know, usually these meetings would be empty, um, but they keep coming and they manage, if not to stop things, to delay projects. Um, so these are photos from both of both sides of the river. Uh, and this, this picture here shows um, the end of the Bayou Bridge pipeline where it ends at a terminal uh, in St. James and those houses are, are mostly occupied by elderly African Americans, many of them who have um, sicknesses that make them very vulnerable to COVID-19. You can see the oil tanks that often emit uh, fumes uh, and, and they're barely monitored. Um, the mo air monitoring system in Louisiana isn't set up in a way that would definitely protect the communities. It's in a, very, a variety of different places though in St. John the Baptist Parish. Uh, the chloroprene is being monitored now that it's become an issue. But that close the tank. Julie, are you frozen? Does seem like it. Okay. Let's see whether we can get her back on board somehow. All right, I think that Julia is going to rejoin. Have people so who are on the call been down around the Gulf Coast? Oh, maybe she's coming back, sorry. I have. And Julia's back. I actually, uh, she's back, awesome. 
Okay, Julie, welcome back. I've been around the uh, Gulf Coast and uh, even through Kentucky touring areas that have been decimated by the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's not a pretty sight. And she, Julie has really captured some great pictures as she comes back on board. Okay, so let's see. Oh, I don't know why, do you guys still see me? Yes, we can uh, see you. Me... You're okay, back for on. some reason, I don't see you guys, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm back to the march and let's see, uh, gone a little off my script here showing the pictures, but um, the- so um, Julie, you'll need to share your screen again. And I do or don't? You do, and so to get back to there, just go to your dock and click on the Zoom logo. Okay. That'll bring us back to you. Um, huh. And there I'll it just is. Okay. Say, great. Thanks. Oh, he's so for some reason when I click on the photos now, it's taking me to um, uh, uh, taking me out. How do I get it back to so that that doesn't happen? Um, so go back to the Zoom app and then okay. do the share screen. Okay, let's, uh, there we go. We'll share. And then share computer sound again, just in case. Okay, I got that. Did Perfect. I get that wrong again? Or oh, there we are. Okay, uh, and now looks good. I so we can see your screen. Exactly. Perfect. Oh, Great. Okay, Thanks, sorry Julie. about that little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and again, these are some of the, the photos from the different protests. Um, and um, the Poor People's Campaign has come down to lend support. Um, Sharon and um, Ta Robert Taylor at the Capitol. And even with the, um, the pandemic, they haven't stopped. Uh, they're still protesting. Uh, and, um, you know, in ground zero for the pandemic, the people are still coming out. Um, that's their state rep uh, who hasn't done done much good for them. Um, and Sharon uh, visiting her church, uh, which they leave open. Um, but they, they've all been doing as much social distancing as they can. But, oh, <laughs> I've got a visitor here. Hang on a second. Okay, I knew that that was bound to happen. So, um, Anyway, um, the pandemic hasn't slowed them down very much, and they're still fighting for clean air, um, despite their vulnerability to the virus. And they are scared of getting it, but it, it just isn't going to stop them because they're so committed to stopping new projects and stopping Danka from continuing to expose them to the, to the chlorine. Um, so. They're, as you might have heard, there are already uh, studies linking pollution exposure to one's likelihood of getting COVID-19. Um, and no surprise, the industry in Louisiana is denying it's playing a role in hurting the health of those who live by its fence lines. And the state hasn't done much to address the connection between the polluted air and the spread of the virus. Um, the health issues in the Black community are mostly blamed on their bear diets and media accounts about the high death rate failed to mention the role pollution plays in the community's diminished health, which really is pissing people off here. Uh, chemist Wilma Subra, who works for the Louisiana Environmental Action Network, explained that Louisiana's health department um, uh, has shown that many of those dying from COVID-19 have health conditions, um, including respiratory illnesses and congenital heart failure that are associated with the long-term chemical exposure. Uh, the, the very type of exposure you get from living near these petrochemical plants. Uh, many in St. John the Baptist uh, who live near the Denka plant have some type of respiratory issues. And in St. James Fifth Ward, where Sharon lives, um, uh, there are numerous plants and the people have the same type of problems. Um, the, Harvard, the recent Harvard study uh, links to particulate matter, um, uh, links per, uh, exposure to particulate matter to one's likelihood to contracting COVID-19. Um, 
So uh, the Danka plant has specifically uh, denied any role in um, contributing to the issue because they say that they're operating within their permit living limit for the particulate matter, which is true. Um, but um, the scientist um, Wilma pointed out that exposure of toxic chemicals, including small amounts of particulate matter, have a huge impact on the lungs, making fence line community members vulnerable to the virus. Um, impacts from pollution are cumulative. They aren't just about one thing. Um, the particulates can go deep into your lungs and stay there. That's why it's a an issue for those at risk to the virus. Um, now Formosa and Danka reps are pointing out that they make components for the medical industry, not just throw away plastic, um, which makes their plants essential, but haven't qualified how much of their product will be used for that. Now, fear of catching the virus, um, like I said, isn't keeping, keeping them at home, and they're continuing to plan uh, events to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, they've, one of their biggest fears is that they're just wiped out and no one knows what's going on there. Um, let's see, so um, there's Wilma. Okay, and now I'm jumping to the source of um, where some of the material from the Permian Basin is going to make its way to the Gulf Coast and even to you guys up, up north. Um, this is a video to, that shows kind of the hub in the Permian Basin. You can stop many different places and see this kind of activity going on. Hardly shows the slowdown of uh, any kind of drilling operation. It's just standing in one, one spot and around like a cell phone. Uh, and then this landscape also gives an idea of what we're doing on public lands. This is public lands outside of Carlsberg. And uh, all of the uh, black tubing is used to produce water, which is wastewater. <laughs> All right, there we go. I got got that going. Um, so, oh, get that video to the end there. That just wanted to give you an idea of uh, what's going on out there. One of the first places I, I, I went out there twice this year before the pandemic, or actually at the start of the pandemic, was my last trip early March, and I found where the Permian Highway pipeline is being built now, and this is an image of that. And it's going uh, down from the basin uh, through Texas's, some gorgeous land in Texas near Austin and to the coast. And uh, I know people are still fighting that pipeline, but um, you can see uh, pictures of it being built uh, in March. And then these other pictures are just random pipelines that I don't know whose pipeline they are. I met a worker. Um, from Exxon, who told me one of the pipelines being built is um, to tank battery site. So there was all kinds of construction that I'm showing you going on um, just at the start of March. And um, oh, let's see. Uh, and then along with the pipeline construction, uh, you can find all kinds of flares there everywhere. Um, and we see this one next to a community. Um, and one next to playground. And um, then um, here's a slide from one of Earthworks. Uh, it's Sharon Wilson who's using that optical flare camera that Ned was talking about. You could say something about this place. That'd be good. Okay, this is a flare that is unlit again. And so when people get really upset over flares that have a big flame coming out of them, I don't blame them. They look scary, but this is a kind of scary that you can't see and it's way worse for um, health and the climate than a lit flare is. 
And which site is this? This is MDC Texas Operator Seattle Slough. Seattle Slough. So um, Sharon's been documenting sites through the Permian Basin for the last couple of years. And she follows up with complaints to the, um, the regulators and hopes for action. Um, and she took me to meet this one family uh, outside of Carlsberg that um, had the un, uh, unfortunate uh, accident of a pipeline blowing up across the street from them and spraying them and their house with produced water. And it, it's a, an example of, you know, kind of double tragedy. You, you know, here you have people who have been exposed and they haven't yet to receive the help that they need. It's always hard to find a, a, a lawyer when you're in a situation like this because most of the lawyers have represented or represent oil company interests. So there are very few independents that would be able to help them. And their chickens were contaminated, so they can't eat the eggs. And then here comes a pandemic. And some of the food that they would be able to sustain themselves on, they can't even touch. Um, so that's kind of um, a tragic story there. And uh, I did make it up to the Shell Cracker front last November to check out what was going on for myself and had planned to already have revisited the Ohio Valley, but I'm kind of stuck here in Kensal Alley because of the pandemic. Uh, but I took some pictures too, uh, right from the standoff cliff. Uh, you can see the event there where that new Cancer Institute just opened. And it's a little hard to uh, get away from the irony there. Uh, but even now, what that would be closed or now reopening due to the pandemic. Uh, now, this is, these are the last slides I've got, which are images of uh, open Louisiana protests, uh, which you haven't heard too much about because uh, it's a smaller group of people than some of the Northern states. Um, but they're being funded by the same groups and people that are funding the climate denial movement, uh, which you can go to Desmog and there's all kinds of reporting on that. Um, but it, it goes to show you how difficult it is to fight back to stop these things because basically um, there's industry capture and um, lobbyists are telling politicians what to do and the politicians are bought and paid for. Uh, so uh, that's one of the hurdles we have to you know, fight back and let logic prevail and stop things that are hurting the planet and people from being built. So that's it. Thank you so much, Julie. That was that was an incredible display of uh, pictures, especially how massive those oil refineries are and, and as well as the chemical plants. I believe you were saying chloroprene, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's how you say it. Yeah. And um, okay. it's used to make neoprene, uh, which is in wetsuits and other like tires, specialty items. And only recently the company started making it clear that they're also be, it's used to make some specialty medical stuff, but we've never heard that before until the pandemic. Um, the, the people in the coalition against Death Alley want to see the plants closed down. Uh, at least until the pandemic's over to give the communities a break, if not altogether. Um, but, you know, they're fighting, the industry's fighting back, saying they're essential. And there are COVID deaths that are fraudulent, right? <laughs> and, and you are correct. Those, those people living in the communities, the, the pollution itself makes them more susceptible to uh, cancer to uh, COVID. Uh, Dr. Uh, Qatar, is, is there something you want to add to uh, that presentation? Well, I, I think the photographs were uh, really remarkable. Um, uh, it, it's really striking to me uh, how you have uh, residents in Cancer Alley uh, in Louisiana uh, who um, are fighting this and they're not getting anywhere in fighting it. And, and a lot of it has to do with the resources. They just don't have uh, the resources uh, to fight it. 
Um, there, it's really an uphill battle. Uh, I, I'd like to think that we have the resources here in Southwest Pennsylvania to fight the coming petrochemical hub. Uh, we certainly have uh, uh, environmental health advocates uh, that I am aligned with, um, uh, fighting very hard uh, to, to, you know, really to put a stop to it. It's, it's just, uh, it's just from a health standpoint, this is terrible. Uh, from an economic standpoint, it's nonsensical. Um, uh, when the demand for plastic is going down and down and down, and when we need to keep uh, the fossil fuels in the ground. So, um, you know, well, hopefully more and more people will stick to the science. Well, and there, there is an unforeseen consequence of the pandemic that a lot of people could have predicted were coming, but didn't, is that what he has succeeded in doing is by going to the meetings and making themselves heard, they have managed to delay things. And in, in the course of delaying things, a couple of the petrol projects have pulled, pulled out altogether, or at least for now, uh, because you know Trump puts on new uh, tariffs and then it's too expensive. That happened with one of the plants that uh, dropped out of the equation. And just last week or the week before, a company called Southern Methanol that plan to build storage tanks in St. James um, is seeking to get its permit renewed rather than build as planned. Their, their permit is about to run out. And so, you know, even without all the resources here, um, running down the clock is, is another, another way to do it. But it, to stop that Formosa plant, um, Sharon's convinced she can do it, but it would be about a miracle because the, the governor here, a Democratic governor, rolled out the red carpet before the community even knew uh, that um, it was planned, which is something that I found to be in common with the community in Beaver County. Not that many people knew what was coming until they actually saw it being built. And, um, you know, of course, some people did, but if people really could visualize what, what it was going to look like. Um, more people might have helped stop it before it started. Wow. Um, the other thing I want to remind our, our uh, participants is that there is another session on Thursday where it is going to be a, an incredible uh, back and forth talking about what you learned today. Uh, there was one other question for Ned about what happens when a weather inversion hits a valley uh, with uh, uh, the chemicals in the smog? Well, weather inversion is uh, when a layer of warmer air sits on top, a layer of cooler air. Uh, and when that happens, um, all the pollution, uh, all the chemicals are uh, very close to the ground and they don't really effectively uh, get blown away. Uh, you know, the Pittsburgh area has had a history of uh, weather inversions, uh, the Denora smog event, um, oh, what was that, 1949, I think, um, uh, that, that was devastating, killed a lot of people. Um, and we get uh, quite a number of weather inversions in our region. Uh, you know, we're an area of uh, river valleys and hills, and so uh, air pollution tends to settle in the lowest parts to begin with, and then you get an inversion and that pollution stays there where people live and people work, uh, where kids go to school, where kids play. Uh, and that, that becomes, uh, you know, there are more dangerous exposures when that happens. And, you know, the Pittsburgh area is also home to many industries that produce uh, really a lot of pollution, a lot of air pollution, and uh, that's a problem in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, BJ, is um, there anything else that we need to discuss on this call before we uh, tell you thank you and uh, we're done? Yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Peggy, Ned, and Julie for sharing your time and your knowledge and perspectives this evening. I don't know about everybody else, but I've been working with this for a while and I learned stuff tonight. So I am very grateful. I'm also, I'm also honored and I'm humbled working with so many people that have the dedication and love of our communities and the future for our next seven generations. It's just, I, just words don't even 
don't even get there. Um, but we hope that everyone watching this tonight has gained more insight and understands why we all must work together to stop the uh, expansion of this petrochemical nightmare, but also work to create spaces for true innovation, solutions, and a just and equitable transition to a peaceful and prosperous future for us all. We also hope that you will join us Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It's gonna be a less formal, uh, but an equally or even more important event. To, and we're gonna ask you to share your stories so we can get to know one another better, find ways to change this trajectory we find ourselves on now. We also ask for you to share this information with your communities, family, friends, neighbors. We will have this recording of the webinar available online for you you to share for us to go back over it there's so much i don't even i know i don't remember all of it but it's is a wonderful resource if people have questions share it on your social media we'll have links for you and keep an eye out for an, an email with links especially if you signed up on the campaign page it will include dates and times for the continuation of the series and remember you can go to people over petro too you can go to the campaign website and ask questions uh, get contacts for people just stay with us and um, just I'm very so grateful may you and your loved ones your community remain safe and well good night from me and mine and now I'll pass it back to Ryan who's going to have a little more technical information about our forum and other other information thank you so much Ryan and thank you everyone for the gift of your time this evening take care thank you PJ Hey, thanks so much. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for coming in. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how the forum uh, is working here. And I'm going to post a link in the chat to it right away. Um, this is where you can join. You can actually join with a uh, Facebook account if you want to. It's really easy. You don't have to create any um, anything new necessarily. Um, but uh, the way that it works is it's a private social forum for this series. So you can bring questions, comments, things that came up, and we can all participate and get in touch with each other. And I'm going to share my screen because I just want you to see that it's also where you can find out about, and let me see, you can see the A to Z Plastics uh, video is here. Um, this is the group you can invite other people to join it with you. And you can see now who's online from the group. There's a group chat, an all member chat uh, in the forum as well. And again, this is just a place to continue connecting leading up, but being part of this forum is also the uh, way to get the reminders and the links for each of the sessions. Um, I saw somebody in the chat posted the virtual Frackland tour. So I'll just give that a shout out if you're in the forum you will also see events like this. So other events from other groups in the region that are working on these issues. So hop over and check out the campaign network and the link is in the chat. And uh, that's my piece. So thank you so much for, for being here. And, and uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you to all the amazing speakers and look forward to getting the video ready and out to you as soon as uh, we wrap this up tonight. All right, thank you very much, Ned. Thank you, Julie. That was exceptional. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks everybody for coming together. We appreciate it. We sure nice do. Nice to see you. Thank all. you. That was an awesome start, guys. <laughs> good, good job. I'm giving you a round of applause. Yay. Thank you, Ryan, yeah. for getting all this together. You did a great job. Thank you. So did you. Thank like you. Like Reverend Barber says, Stay inside, okay. stay alive, organize, organize, organize. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good Guys. night. Thanks, everybody. See you Thursday. <laughs> see you Thursday. See you, on the, see you on the campaign network, everybody. Hey, Ryan, before you go, is the chat going to be saved? Yep. Okay, cool. Just a tech, another technical question. <laughs> you take care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's let's stay in touch. All right. Yeah. All right. Take Bye care, everybody. Everyone.